Healing properties of maggot therapy. That's been one of, one of my interests. Before I get into my interests, I need to remind you all that, uh, that I am on the board of directors of the Better Foundation, which supports patient care education and research in maggot therapy and the other biotherapies and conferences like this. Co-founder of Monarch Labs, which produces and distributes medical grade maggots, and staff physician at the Orange County Healthcare Agency, uh, along with uh, some consulting and speaking for HIV pharmaceutical companies. MDT stands for Maggot Debridement Therapy. A lot of focus in maggot therapy is on debridement. In the United States, the FDA has cleared for marketing one brand of medicinal maggots uh, for debridement only. And that's based on research, clinical research that includes controlled clinical trials that demonstrate uh, debridement efficacy and safety. We've heard today that there are antimicrobial effects of maggot therapy. And I'm going to discuss growth promotion, healing effects associated with maggot therapy. But the large-scale clinical trials don't exist, and that's why what I'm saying uh, now is not cleared by FDA for marketing. a very large, well-controlled clinical trial of maggot therapy to investigate the effect of maggots in healing. Uh, and that shows some, some considerable doubt uh, where no uh, benefit has been seen against control. And so, what I want to do is look at what is the evidence, what additional evidence is needed, should we uh, continue in this line of thought. We'll look at clinical and laboratory studies. And I'm going to present uh, a case, an unreported case, uh, to, to demonstrate how I've looked at the issue of, of wound healing. So in this, uh, on this chalkboard, uh, you see what I teach and what I'll teach at the workshop on, uh, on Sunday about the three major actions associated with maggot therapy. Debridement, disinfection, and the promotion of wound healing. Debridement has been noted since, since the early part of the century and repeated in laboratory and clinical investigations again and again. Disinfection we've talked about today as well. Growth healing, the evidence is smaller. I want to focus on Bayer's work in the 1930s where he described his observations in this way. If you debride a wound with maggots, and return to conventional therapy, the wound will heal just as fast as with conventional therapy. If he applied the maggots beyond the point of debridement, if he continued treating with the maggots, even though there was no substantial necrotic tissue left, he observed that the wounds healed faster than controls. So when we started our studies in 1990, this being, I think, my second patient, this is what I observed. A 61-year-old diabetic man who had been in the hospital for a couple weeks by this point. Uh, there's a ruler cut off on this uh, slide, but there had been no uh, significant change in his, his wound despite IV antibiotic treatment. and. 
twice a week uh, surgical treatment. So we began uh, maggot therapy and we noticed a substantial decrease in, a, in uh, not only the, the condition of the wound bed, but also the size of the wound. We stopped according to our protocol after three weeks and what happened was his wound actually increased in size and became sluffy. So we reapplied the maggots. Not much change, but at least it didn't, it wasn't growing anymore. Then we stopped according to our protocol. And this time the wound grew substantially. Now all this time, the control therapy, this is, this is on, a, on a study protocol, the control therapy is dictated by the wound care team. So we reapplied the maggot therapy. And this went on and on uh, for a couple months. And what we observed was that the, the wounds got bigger when we took off the maggots. They got smaller when we put on the maggots. But eventually, at some point, the, maggot con the wounds continued to, uh, to, to get smaller and heal. So we didn't put the maggots on till the very end. And you can see here that after the third cycle of, uh, or third set of cycles of maggot therapy, the wound uh, came down and, and ultimately closed. The way we did it when the wounds were necrotic, three times a week maggot therapy, two, two to three days each cycle. When the wounds were uh, clean, then we would do once weekly therapy and uh, that would go on for three, uh, three weeks to four weeks and then we'd, we'd uh, stop and see what happened to the wound. Let me show you another case, a 46 year old paraplegic man who was my fourth patient uh, to help to breed his post-surgical flap wounds, which became infected, dehissed, uh, and we cleaned them out. And they did well. But he was left still with this clean, to the, to the naked eye it's clean, clean uh, wound bed where his flaps uh, and some grafts had been, had been taken. You, this is over the sacrum. His head is at the top of the screen. Rectum would be here. Head would be up here. He was a very tall man. And you have this triangular wound, which was scheduled for split thickness skin graft. But that surgery date was many, many weeks ahead. And he had requested maggot therapy because it worked so well on his uh, infected wounds. I did not think it would do him any good. This is a clean wound. Um, but I agreed to see what would happen. Uh, uh, I agreed to put some maggots on that. And um, we started when his, his uh, surgery was four weeks away. What happened was that a retained suture, nylon suture, was uncovered. The tissue around it dissolved away. The, the uh, nylon suture popped out, healed over. But in addition, we could see some, some islands of epithelial cells not connected to, to this uh, tissue here. And that, that was a bit surprising because he hadn't formed anything like that in months. So we thought he had no tissue you know, underneath, like hair follicles that could possibly uh, uh, be sprouting that. Um, but it was beginning to close pretty quickly, and his, his surgical date uh, had to be moved up a week from four to three weeks. Um, but as it turns out, his, his wound continued to heal. His surgery date was moved up another week uh, to two weeks from the time we started, but the, uh, the wound was healed in two weeks uh, after all, and he didn't get his surgery. Uh, that was the last patient I was allowed to treat in that uh, hospital, by the way. <laughs> 
No joke. Um, and it, that, that's one of the, the, these are two of the cases that really got me thinking of, of uh, the wound healing effects of the maggots. Now, we, we took these anecdotal reports, because as we heard the other day, and, and should continue to, to uh, emphasize among ourselves, anecdotal reports are nice to get you started, to get you thinking about what's going on, and need to motivate us uh, to, to look at how to gather evidence and see if it really happens, if it doesn't happen, and so forth. And so we did uh, controlled analyses of the, of the wound healing effects. And we found that the sizes in a series of patients uh, with pressure ulcers and also with diabetic foot ulcers had their four and eight week healing times substantially uh, decreased compared to controls. And here you can see a plot of the percent granulation tissue of maggot-treated wounds compared to, compared to control-treated wounds, uh, which don't, uh, on average, don't seem to be sprouting as much granulation tissue. Biopsies of these wounds showed an abundance of neovascularization. And so uh, this paper was brought up uh, uh, earlier. Um, uh, we, did, uh, we did some tissue culture studies to look at what are the mechanisms that, that are going on, really, and demonstrated that the fibroblasts exposed to uh, secretions from the maggots had uh, a faster, um, faster replication rates uh, to, to, to grow on the comments uh, in our discussion a little bit earlier. I should mention that, that uh, not in that paper is the fact that when we added higher concentrations of those enzymes, the, uh, the cells did not reproduce faster. They actually, uh, it was toxic to the, uh, to the cells. But in low concentrations, it stimulated uh, mitosis. Let's look at the evidence from, from other groups. We see here Wolina. Uh, uh, Wolina's group showing that the tissue oxygenation around the wound during maggot therapy increases, ostensibly from uh, um, increased perfusion. And when the maggot therapy is halted, it goes back down to baseline. So at least during therapy, there's greater oxygenation, greater perfusion around the wound, which might have some effect as, as well. As far as the uh, angiogenesis I showed, we also looked at tissue culture, endothelial cells, and showed that endothelial cell replication was increased when exposed to the maggot secretions. But angiogenesis does not explain Wolina's finding. This is not angiogenesis. This is temporary uh, uh, increased perfusion that goes back down to baseline afterwards. Pritchard, Horobin, and the others looked at a uh, three-dimensional model of uh, uh, gel, mod gel suspension model of wound healing in the laboratory. And as most of you know, they had been studying the proteases and now show that these extracts actually were associated with increased migration of the fibroblasts over the top of the wound. And what does this mean, and what relevance does it have to wound healing? Wounds often, wounds normally heal from the periphery. The cells replicate unidirectionally towards the center. But in their model, they saw that these cells were actually breaking off from the periphery and migrating to the center of the a wound. And when you have that, then those cells can replicate in 360 degrees in all directions. 
And so wound healing potentially could be much faster because now you have separate islands uh, coming together instead of uh, unidirectional healing. And for all we know, maybe, maybe that's related, maybe that's not related to the picture we saw clinically earlier. The group uh, hypothesizes that maybe it's these proteolytic enzymes that are cleaving adhesins or at um, uh, molecules that anchor the cells at the periphery to the skin, and that is what uh, allows them to float across. Recently, there have been uh, papers showing that maggot secretions destroy biofilm and they inhibit the growth of new biofilm. Now biofilm is very important because um, bacteria in biofilm are much, much more difficult to treat than free living bacteria that we have in test tubes and we add some reagents to and they're easily killed, they're easily attacked. Biofilm seems to be the, uh, a major, if not the major way that bacteria really live on wounds and, and uh, hardware and so forth. So maybe biofilm is, biofilm inhibition and destruction is one of the ways that maggots kill bacteria in vivo. But maybe that clean wound that did not heal in the patient who was waiting for his graft, maybe that was covered with biofilm too. Because we can't always see biofilm. Biofilm isn't just in those grungy wounds that we see. It can be micros microscopic and is, is believed by many to account for lots of non-healing wounds, even clean non-healing wounds. So maybe what I was seeing was stimulation in other ways, Maybe it was the physical activity of the maggots over the wound. Physical activity is known to release local cytokines. Or maybe they were dissolving biofilm that I just couldn't see. So how do you put that uh, into the context of solid, controlled clinical studies uh, that extend all the way to wound healing? Um, again, the, the, the clinical studies have, have been short, look, so far, short looking at debridement and observing healing. But here you have a study that continues all the way to wound healing as we should and as we need. So I want to look at this study. And what we see is the treatment which was maggot therapy, was applied during the debridement phase and was halted thereafter. And the result was the time to ulcer healing did not differ between the two groups, the control and the maggot treated group. Although the, the study confirms that the median time to wound healing in the larval treated group uh, was, um, sorry, the, the median time to healing was essentially unchanged uh, between the two groups. 236 days in the maggot group versus 245 days, uh, which was not statistically significant. The difference of maggot therapy induced to Breedmont was clear. 14 days versus 28 days uh, for the uh, maggots in, uh, in uh, contained dressings. And with the hydrogel, five times, five times longer it took to completely debride, 72 days. So what I take out of that uh, important study is that our clinical studies, the few that have been extended all the way up to total wound healing, support the observations of William Baer and the other maggot therapists 80 years ago. Maggots are great debreeders, but if you stop there, wound healing is normal. If you continue 
to treat the wounds with maggots? Well, we really need more answers there. What if you continue the um, maggot therapy beyond this, the point of full debridement? Bayer says it's faster. The studies that go on for four and eight weeks show faster healing time. So we need some clinical studies that go all the way to healing, like Dumville's study, but that also look at maggot therapy thereafter. Or take your data, like, like the data from that study. Maybe you have data too. I made this uh, I make this recommendation to everyone. If you have data and photographs and measurements during maggot therapy and you're continuing with the wound, look at that data after you stop maggot therapy. Are your wounds also continuing to heal or sometimes stagnating or getting larger? And if so, do uh, uh, do some investigations. Gather some, some data so that you feel comfortable on and off maggot therapy if necessary. But then use that data. Have a, uh, controlled data so that we can follow this all the way to the point of, of complete healing and uh, see what are the clinical usefulness of those observations. Thank you.